Good morning, and welcome to the Saturday morning breakfast Bible study with Pastor Lydia Evelyn Spragan and the Patton Memorial Christian Methodist Episcopal Church located at 3547 East 142nd Street in Cleveland, Ohio, 44120. Uh, let us pray. Gracious Father, we come at this time and at this hour to be with you and to study your word. We ask, Father, that you would send your Holy Spirit to be with us, to lead us and to guide us in the study of your word. Father God, we ask that our hearts and our minds are open to receive the teaching that he has for us on this Saturday morning. And Father God, we ask that you would bless the reading of your word. And Father God, in this new year, help us to become doers, not only hearers of your word. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Good morning. Um, today, let us turn to the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. Genesis. In some of our Bibles, it will say the first book of Moses. Please let me know if you can hear me. Okay. Now, I operate under the assumption that if you can understand the first 11 chapters of Genesis, then you can understand the rest of the Bible, the whole Bible, the entire Bible. Uh, it is my premise that once we lay the foundation for the first 11 books, the first 11 chapters rather, and get through those and really have a good understanding of those, that we will be able to really understand the rest of the Bible. So today, I want to start a study in Genesis. Now, I'm going to lay a framework, and there are going to be some things that you already know and some things that are going to be new to you. Um, today, I'm just going to basically start an overview uh, as to why we need to study the book of Genesis. Um, first of all, let us look at Genesis. It is part of the first five books which we know as the Torah, the Torah. Um, it was all on one scroll. There were no chapters or verses. Um, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Now, if you look at the top of each of those books, in some Bibles, and you may want to pencil it in if it's not in your Bible, Genesis is called the first book of Moses, the first book of Moses. Exodus, when you get to it, is the second book of Moses. Leviticus, when you get to it, is the third book of Moses. Numbers, when you get to it, is the fourth book of Moses. And lastly, Deuteronomy is the fifth book of Moses. And they are called books of Moses because M Moses is the author of them. Now, there is some debate by some people as to whether or not Moses is the the, the author of Genesis. I'm not going to get into that. I'm just simply going to say four purposes of our study, Moses is the author of the first five books of the Bible. Now, these first five books of the Bible are also known as the Torah, T-O-R-A-H, Torah. And if you, in the Hebrew, the word Torah means instruction or teaching. 
Now, later on, it came to mean the law. But for our purposes, we're going to stick with instruction and teaching. The first five books collectively are also called the Pentateuch, P-E-N-T-A-T-E-U-C-H, Pentateuch, P-E-N-T-A-T-E-U-C-H. And the purpose of Genesis is to introduce us uh, to and to progressively reveal God. So the purpose is to introduce us to. How does it introduce us to? In the very first sentence it says, in the beginning God. The first question that we have is who is God? So we're going to be introduced to God, and then it's going to progressively reveal God to us. Um, progressively reveal. You might want to underline that. Because we want to see how is God progressively revealed to us. What do we learn about God as we go through the first 11 chapters of Genesis? Now, the author of Genesis, as I said, is Moses, but the real author of the whole Bible we know, and we're going to be putting together everything that we've learned uh, so far on how to study the Bible as we go through the first 11 chapters. God used the hand of Moses to write the words breathed by God. And we've looked at these scriptures before, but it doesn't hurt for us to remind ourselves what does what do we mean by breathed. In 2 Timothy, the third chapter and the 16th verse, we find these words. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So we've got four purposes of scripture, teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Second scripture that we want to look at is Romans 15, chapter 15, verse 4. Romans 15, verse 4. And it reads, for everything that was written for our instruction, so that through endurance and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. So as we look at these, at, at the first 11 chapters of Genesis, we're going to be looking for teaching, we're going to be looking for rebuking, we're going to be looking for correcting, we're going to be looking for training in righteousness, but we're also going to be looking for something that gives us hope, some part of the scripture or the text that gives us hope. And lastly, we look at 2 Peter 1, 20, verse 20 to 21. And it reads, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture comes from one's own interpretation. For no such prophecy was ever brought about through human initiative, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So we want to realize that what we are reading beginning with the book of Genesis, is, is written by Moses, but it was spoken by God as he was carried along by the Holy Spirit. So this is God's revelation to us of himself. Now, I have a Bible here that I've started my study in, as I told you, and I have notes in my Bible. 
And I, of course, write in my Bible. You can't see it, but I write in my Bible and I highlight and I under, underline things as I go so that when I go back to it, I can look at it again. So Genesis, right under Genesis, you want to write book of beginnings, beginnings, book of beginnings. And you want to write in the beginning and you want to circle that. And that's the first word. And it's also the first uh, in the Hebrew Bible. It is known by its first words. And the first word is Bereshet. B-E-R-E-S-H-I-T. So Bereshet in the beginning. That's the first word of the book of Genesis. And it's also the name of the book of Genesis in the Hebrew Bible. Bereshit, in the beginning. So what do you think that we're going to be talking about here? It is called the book of first things. The book of first things. The book of beginnings or the book of first things. It is also called generation generation and you'd be surprised as what the generations are and we'll get to that in a few minutes so in the hebrew bereshet book of beginnings the first word bereshet in the bible is in translated in the beginning and it is also called the book of first things in the greek it talks about origins, origins, O-R-I-G-I-N-S, origins. That is, where did it all begin? Who is the source? Now, instinctively, we're going to find out that God is the source. But let us say that we don't know anything about this God. What are we going to learn when we read the book of Genesis? about God, about where, what God wants us to know about him. Now, it's a progressive revelation. So if we start to write, we say, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, so if we look over here, we say God is a creator. That is the first thing that we learn about him is that he is a creator. The second thing that we should learn about him in that particular time is that God is. God was. God will always be. How do we get that out of there? In the beginning, God. In the beginning, whenever time began, was in the past, in the beginning, God existed. So God was already in existence at the time of the beginning. Now, it's very important that we understand the book of Genesis because it is one of the most controversial books in the Bible. If people want to really argue with you about stuff, they start talking about creation and the book of Genesis. So it is, it is, I guess, to our good that we would be laid on a very sure foundation about what we believe about the book of Genesis. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, so I've written some notes, so I'm going to go back to my notes so that I can stay on track. Genesis is divided into Toledoth, Toledoth, T-O-L-E-D-O-T, or T-O-L-E-D-O-T-H. You can sometimes find it spelled both ways. And that's generations or births. And we can find the divisions of Genesis by looking for the Toledoth in Genesis. That's the phrases. And the phrases usually begin with this is the generations of 
or it begins with this is the account of, or it begins with this is the history of, depending on your translation. Now, the next thing we need to know is there were no chapters and verses in the original text in the scroll. Uh, chapters and verses are not inspired by God, but they are man-made contrivances for convenience. It, it makes it easy for us to locate references to passages. However, it also presents awkward breaks in grammar and thought. And as we look at Genesis as a whole, we're not going to necessarily uh, keep to the chapter verse breaks because we want to maintain the thought pattern and the grammatical pattern of the original language. Now, just because it looks like it's a straight story in Genesis, it is, but it's made up both of generations and narratives. You have a narrative and then you have a generation story. Narrative and then a generation story. A narrative and then a generation story. So as you start to read the book of Genesis, and I hope you will, you will be able to put down N for narrative, which means story form, and G for generations. Now, let's look at these taller dogs or tolly dot. Now, uh, turn to Genesis 2 and 4. So we'll see that it starts off with a narrative. So we put an N at the beginning. But when we turn to Genesis 2 and 4, we find these are the generations of the heavens and the earth. Heavens and the earth. So we've got a G there that we're going to put for generations. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth. At chapter 5, verse 1, we again have another break. It says, this is the book of the generations of Adam. Put a G there. Now, in between everywhere where we have the G, we'd expect to find some type of narrative or story form. Okay. The next part, or the next tall part of the Toledoff, is Genesis 6 and 9. Genesis 6 and 9. And we read, these are the generations of Noah. These are the generations of Noah. And I'm using the uh, King James Version this morning. And I'm going to be using that throughout because I'm going to use this, whole, this uh, particular Bible as my study Bible. Genesis 6 and 9. These are the generations of Noah. Then we get to 10 and 1, chapter 10, verse 1. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Then we get to 11, 10, chapter 11, verse 10. And it says, these are the generations of Shem. These are the generations of Shem. Then we get to uh, 1127. 1127. Now these are the generations of Terah. These are the generations of Terah. Then we get to chapter 25, verse 12. 
chapter 25, verse 12. And it reads, Now these are the generations of Ishmael. Ishmael. Chapter 25, 19. And these are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Then we get to 36, chapter 36, verse 1. Now these are the generations of Esau, who is Edom. Then we turn to chapter 37, verse 2. These are the generations of Jacob. These are the generations of Jacob. Now, if we go back and we count Genesis 2-4, Genesis 5-1, Genesis 6-9, Genesis 10-1, one Genesis 11 10 Genesis 11 27 Genesis 25 and 12 Genesis 25 and 19 Genesis 36 and 1 and Genesis 37 and 2 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Taladoc, 10. There are 10 divisions that Moses has written the book of Genesis in. And he has broken them down as generations. So as you look at the book of beginnings, you're also going to look at Genesis as the book of generations, beginning with the generations of the heaven and the earth and ending with the generation of Jacob. Now, I want us to take a moment here and just... Uh, look at why it is important for us to understand uh, Genesis 1 through 11. Now, we're going to do this by reading the places in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Ephesians, Colossians. In fact, almost all the books of the Bible have a reference to Genesis 1 through 11. That's just how important it is. And I'm going to take my time and walk through these so that you will have an understanding as to how the Bible ties Genesis with the rest of the Bible. So we're going to turn to Genesis. I'm going to do the Genesis portions first, and then I'm going to turn to the New Testament portions. Okay? So we're looking at Genesis as it relates to the New Testament. Genesis 1 and 27. Genesis 1 and 27. And I'm going to use a highlighter this time, a yellow highlighter, because I want to make sure that I get the verses right and the connections. Now, in some of your Bibles, if you have a study Bible, you may see reference verses. These are um, the, uh, the references to the passage where you can find support for this particular verse. So if you get to Genesis 1 and 27, on the bottom of your verse, you may have Matthew 19 and 4. So look for, if you have a study Bible, look for the reference at the corner of the verse, and that's where we'll be going today to tie it together. So in verse uh, Genesis 1, 27, it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. 
male and female created he them. So I'm going to highlight that. And this same type of reference is made in Genesis 5 and 2. Genesis 5 and 2. And it says, male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day they were created. Male and female created he them. In Matthew the 19th chapter and the fourth verse. Matthew, the 19th chapter and the fourth verse, we find. As soon as I can get to it. Matthew, the 19th chapter and the fourth verse, we find, and he answered them and said unto them who is this talking this is jesus talking and he says have ye not read that he met he which made them at the beginning made them male and female this is jesus referring back and incorporating genesis in his own speech have ye not read, he says, created male and female. So we can get the concept that created male and female in the beginning. Made them male and female. That's the concept. Let's go to Genesis 2 and 24. Therefore, shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife and they shall cleave and they shall become one flesh so i'm going to highlight that verse again i'm going to turn to matthew 19 in verse 5 and 6 we read and said for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and the tw and they twain shall be one flesh wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh where therefore god have joined together let no man put asunder and here we're talking about cleaving to the wife And becoming one flesh. Again, this is Jesus talking. In Genesis, the sixth chapter, Genesis, the sixth chapter, and then go to the third and fourth verses, third through the fifth verses, we find these words. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. A hundred and twenty years. There were giants in also the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bear children to them, and the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. We're talking about the days of Noah here, the days of Noah. And what was going on at that time? 
the days of Noah. So I'm going to write a little a little note here in my Bible after I've highlighted it. And I'm going to put days of Noah. And then I'm going to turn to Matthew, the 24th chapter. And I'm going to begin at the 37th verse. And I'm going to find these words. But in the days of Noah, and in some Bibles it's N-O-E, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. That should give us a big hint right there. First of all, I'm going to circle the word but. Because I always circle the word but wherever I find it in the Bible. Because that means there's a change in direction of thought there. But, but as in the days of Noah, but as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away so shall be so shall the coming also the coming of the son of man be hmm that gives us a hint as to what is going on we could put the passages together for Jesus is still speaking now we're talking about the importance the importance of knowing the foundation of Genesis 1 through 11 and how it relates to New Testament uh, scripture. Let's look again at Genesis 1 and 2, 5 and 2. We've already looked at them and read them in Genesis. Um, and it talked about the created male and female. So if we're going to look at it again, we would turn to Mark. Mark is the next book after Matthew. And in Mark 10, we shall see in verse 6, Mark 10, verse 6, where Mark again talks about created male and female. Mark 10, verse 6. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And then if we go on to Mark 7 through 9, we'll talk, we'll see where Mark is talking about cleaving to his wife and becoming one flesh, as in Genesis, which we just read. But this calls shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. Cleave to his wife. And they twain shall be one flesh. So then they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God have joined together, let no man put asunder. Okay. It's important as we read that we see that uh, even though a lot of people try to do away with Genesis and the importance of Genesis, even as we go through the New Testament, we can see the passages of Genesis being quoted by Jesus the Christ. Uh, let's turn to uh, Genesis again, 1-1. It says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And in some and in some Bible translations, it's translated heavens and the earth. And in most times when I look at it and I go heavens, I generally I generally put an S on the end. Heavens and the earth. More than one heaven. Um You'll, you'll, as you read the Bible, you'll talk about, you'll remember in Corinthians, Paul says, talks about the third heaven. Um, there's some other 
uh, verses that we can point to that we'll get to that talks about plurality of the heavens, more than one. Um, and then in Genesis 2 and 4, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth. Again, here it says heavens, you can see in the, uh, I'm, again, I'm using the King James. And in the first verse, it says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. But in 2, 4, it says, these are the generation of the heavens and the earth with the plural S. So you need to, um, when you're in your own study time, you're gonna, you want to look at the word and make sure it's consistent. Now, that's why you have study Bibles, so that you can know, uh, for example, in verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You would look up that verse in the Hebrew, and you would see that heaven is more than one, heavens and the earth. Okay, so uh, let's look at Mark 13. Mark 13, 19. And it says, For in those days shall be affliction, such as was not from the beginning of the creation, which God created unto this time, neither shall be. So it's talking about the creation which God created. So once again, we're not just basing that God created the heavens and the earth on Genesis. We can base it in the New Testament as well in Mark 13, 19. And so I'm going to highlight God created. God created. That's the important point there, God created. Uh, let's talk about Luke. Um, in Genesis 11, 10 through 26, you have the generations from Abraham to Shem. Genesis 11, 10 through 26. 10 through 26. These are the generations of Shem. So now we've already talked about over in, let's go back over here. These are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Okay. And so you have the sons of Japheth first, and then you have the sons of Shem over here. These are the generations of Shem. Now. Then you have in Genesis uh, 5, you have the genealogies from Noah to Adam to God in Genesis 5, from Noah to Adam to God. That's Genesis 5, 3 through 29. Now, I'm not going to read them today because we're going to eventually get to all of them and the importance of the, genes of the uh, genealogies. But what is important is that in Luke, in Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, in the book of Luke, in the third chapter, again, we have the genealogies. And if you turn to Luke, the third chapter, beginning at the 34th verse, which is the son of Jacob, which is the son of Isaac, which was the son of Abraham, which was the son of Thara, which was the son of Nicor, which was the son of Seruk, which was the son of Ragu, which was the son of Phalik, which was the son of Heber, which was the son of Salah, which was the son of Canaan, which was the son of Ar. Ar Faxed, which was the son of Sim, which was the son of Noah, which was the son of Lamech, which was the son of Methuselah, 
which was the son of Enoch, which was the son of Jared, which was the son of Malay, Malayel, which was the son of Canaan, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which is which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. Again, we can get the tracing of the genealogies, beginning with Abraham, from Abraham to Shem, and then from Noah to Adam to God. So again, we have the genealogy here. It is repeated for us. We don't just have to it's repeated for us in the New Testament. And write a bracket around the genealogy. Now, I know a lot of us like to skip the genealogies, but genealogy is very important in the Bible. Um, I liken it to knowing your own family history, where you come from. A lot of us uh, who are in the African American race can only trace our histories back for so many generations and then we lose track of them. But some of us have actually gone on to Ancestry.com and we could trace our histories back to our origin or where we first came from. And we can make those connections. And it becomes very important to us to know where we came from. Likewise, in the Bible, when we skip over the genealogies, we skip over a large part of the history associated with where the people came from and, and how um, the history has evolved. So even if we can't pronounce the words, it's very important for us to remember to read the genealogies. Okay. In Genesis chapter 4, and we're only looking at Genesis 1 through 11 and how Genesis 1 through 11 ties to the New Testament. Genesis chapter 4, verses 8 through 11. Genesis chapter 4, verses 8 through 11. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now, Art thou cursed from the earth, which have opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand? So I'm going to highlight that. And now I'm going to look for the reference for it in the New Testament. And as we highlight and go back over the first 11 chapters of Genesis, we will see just by the highlighting, how much of the New Test Old Testament Genesis 1 through 11 is actually repeated in the New Testament. That's the purpose of the highlighting in, in Genesis 1 through 11. So let us turn to Luke 11.51. And in Luke, the 11th chapter and the 51st verse, eleven fifty one, we find these words. From the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, which perished between the altar and the temple, verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation. Now, we're talking about the blood of Abel. Once again, the New Testament refers to the blood of Abel. The blood of Abel. Let's go back. Genesis 7. Genesis 7. Verse 
the flood came and destroyed all of them. Genesis 7, verse 10. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the foundations of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. And I'm gonna read through until the 23rd verse. And the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. In the self same day entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah and Noah's wife and the three wives of his son with them in the ark. They and every beast after his kind and all the cattle after their kind and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind and every fowl after his kind, every bird of every sort. And they went in unto Noah into the ark two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. And they went, a, they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God has commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. And the flood was 40 days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bare up the ark, and it was lift up above the earth, and the waters prevailed and they were increased greatly upon the earth and the ark went upon the face of the waters and the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered 15 cubits upward did the waters prevail and the mountains were covered and all the flesh died that moved upon the earth both of the fowl and of the cattle and of beasts and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth and every man and all in whose nostrils was the breath of life of all that was in the dry land died and every living substance was destroyed which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and the creeping things and the fowl of the heaven. And they were destroyed from the earth and Noah only remained alive and they that were with him in the ark. Now, in the New Testament, Luke, the 17th chapter and the 27th verse. It says, they did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Here Jesus again is talking and he is going back to what has already been reported in Genesis. And he's not referring to it as a figment of somebody's imagination. He's saying, as a matter of fact, that is what happened. That is what has happened. Let's look at John chapter 1, verses 1 through three. We just read Genesis in the beginning. Look how John starts off his book. He says, in the beginning, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Again, John is saying, in the beginning, God. He wants to point you back to the first words of the Holy Bible, in the beginning. And he says, who 
God. In the beginning was the Word. So in the beginning was the Word. And the Word is capitalized. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Now if you look back at Genesis 1. 1 and 1. You will see. In the beginning God. John is saying God was not by himself. God was in the beginning was the word. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so John is adding a, a dimension here that we need to pay attention to. He says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The word was God. And if you if you tie that down here and I'm ahead of myself now and the word became flesh. The word was made flesh in verse 14 and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth. John is saying something about the deity the divinity of Jesus the Christ. He's also saying something about his origin. He's also saying something about who he was, who he really was. So when we look at in the beginning, God, we are also looking at in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. God spoke and things came into being. The word was present with him and was him. If you look at that word, word in the Greek, Logos, L-O-G-O-S, Logos. In the beginning was the mind of God. And the mind of God was with God. And the mind of God was God. In the beginning, God, the word. You can't be separated from your mind. God can't be separated from his mind. It was his mind, the word that was with him that spoke all of these things into existence. It might be a little bit deep for somebody, but you'll catch it one day. I pray and I hope because it's a very important catch. God, the word of God was God. Catch it, catch it, catch it. Okay. Uh, John 1.10 when it talks about the world was made through him. In Genesis 2 and 3, we find um, these words. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. And because that in it, he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. God created and made it. Means he fashioned it. He, he thought of it himself. He created it, creatio ex nihilo, out of nothing. He created something. And he created man. He created the heavens. He created the earth. And so we look at the world was made through him. Genesis 2 and 3. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because all that was in it, that in it, he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Everything was made by God. We find that again in John 1 and 10. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. The world was made by him. It's not just a passing phrase that John is making. He's, he's alluding back to the world was made by him which is the same concept that we have in Genesis. And we're not talking about, you know, maybe the world was made by him. No, John is stating as a fact, and the world was made by him. 
And then we get to Genesis 3 and 4 through 5 here, where it says, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know it, that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So we're going to highlight that. Again, the purpose of the highlighting is so that we can look at a glance and see how much of the Genesis 1 through 11 is repeated somewhere in the New Testament. John 8 and 44. John 8 and 44. John 8 and 44. Ye are of your father the devil and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. Here, John is making sure that we know that he is the father of lies. And in Genesis, here he has lied to the woman. He has said, ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. They shall not surely die. Okay, we're going to get to it. Just want to, today's purpose is simply to lay the groundwork so that you can see that in the New Testament, Jesus refers to Genesis 1 through 11 quite often. And remember, he is the word and he is God. He was God. He will always be God. And God is speaking about the most controversial book and the most controversial first 11 chapters of Genesis and God is stating in the form of Jesus as facts those things that we have are reading in Genesis. So Genesis 8:44 it tells us that he is the father of lies. I mean John 8:44 tells us that he is the father of lies. The father of lies. And I'm going to write that on the side of my book. Father of lies. And I'm going to say that Satan. That's why sometimes when, when whenever we say to you, whenever Satan's mouth is moving, you know that he is not telling the truth. Everything that he says is not, that ought to give you some hope. If you know that the Satan is the father of lies, then when something negative comes along and it says, uh, you're going to surely die. Maybe not. Your, uh, your mind ought to have some doubt about that, especially if you know the voice of God and you know that the voice that you are hearing is not of God. He is the father of lies. So everything that he is saying, the opposite of it is true. So if you say, if he say, uh, oh, your children are going to be caught up in X, Y, and Z. The devil is a liar. Your children are not going to be caught up in X, Y, and Z. Tell him to his face. That's a lie. That's a bald-faced lie. That's what we are supposed to be as Christians. We are supposed to be bold and stand up to him. Because we know that what he is saying is not the truth. Okay, Acts, let's go to Genesis 2 and 1. The, thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. Now let's turn to Acts 14 and 15. Acts 14 and 15. And I'm not going to get through this all today. So I'm going to stop here and I'm not going to go to Acts. I'm going to mark my page here 
at Acts 14 and 15 and start there on next week. But let's go back to Genesis right quick. And let's just turn the pages between chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And let's just see how much of those chapters we highlighted is being found in the Gospels. So we have a connection now between the book of Genesis and the Gospels as written by Mark, Luke, John, and Matthew. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The Gospels. So there's a connection between Genesis 1 through 11 and the Gospels. And the rest of the New Testament as well, we shall learn. As we continue to make these connections, we'll begin to see the reality of Genesis. And perhaps when, when somebody's not for us to argue with, we don't argue, at least I don't argue about the word. I just simply point you in direction where you can make your own decision about the word of God. But to me, the fact that you can find so much of Genesis 1 through 11 in the New Testament lends some credibility to the fact that this is God. This is God. God speaking. It's the revelation of God to me. It's the progressive revelation of God. Beginning with the words, in the beginning, God. Now, as we go through this book of beginnings, we would expect to find first things because it is the book of first things. And I want you for your homework to begin to read the book of Genesis, especially chapters 1 through 11, and start making a list of the very first things that you find in those particular chapters because Genesis better shit in the beginning, in the beginning. So what first things are we learning about in the beginning that will share with us uh, the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey says? Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you so much for today's Bible study. And we pray, God, that it is beginning to open the eyes of some as how well connected the Bible is. Old Testament to New Testament, Genesis 1 through 11 to the New Testament, that we are not studying a, a disconnect in history, but we are studying a progressive revelation of who you are. You want us to know who you are. And God, we want to know, we want to seek your face and really come to know who you are. Father God, and the more we learn about who you are, help us, Father God, to be transformed into your image and into your likeness, that we might speak the words that you would speak, that we might go the places that you would go, that you we might do the work that you would do, that we might hear and listen as you hear and listen. And most of all, Father God, that we might begin to see others as you see them. For your heart's desire is that none should perish. In the name of Jesus the Christ we do pray. Amen. Until next week at the same time, I would ask that you be safe that you practice social distancing, that you wear your mask, got mine right here, wear your mask, and that you remember to wash your hands often, use the sanitary solutions on them, but most of all, remember to pray. God loves you, and so do I. See you next week, and Happy New Year.